Hello. Welcome to Marathon Swim Stories, where we connect with curious and courageous individuals from all walks of life to explore our relationship with water, what holds people back, and why others keep going, where we investigate the connection that we have with each other, those who support us, and the water that is 70% of our planet. If you've ever stood at the edge of a body of water and wondered, you're in good company. I'm Shannon Keegan, mom, wife, marathon swimmer, swim efficiency coach, and founder of Intrepid Water, where I teach swim freedom, virtually, locally, and abroad. The freedom to get started, break out of your comfort zone, or shatter your preconceived notions of what's possible. Find out more at intrepidwater.com. What does it mean to be a swimmer? Nonetheless, a marathon swimmer. When are labels important, and when do they get in the way? This is a question that I often ponder, whether reading the news, in conversation with my children, my partner, or a friend. It's interesting to observe when we're labeling things, and whether that label is helping you describe something for the sake of understanding, or if you're leaning on the label to stereotype or make generalizations about a group. In the case of the label swimmer, I can remember a time not too long ago that I didn't consider myself a swimmer, per se. I don't swim every day, and I'm not paid to swim. So how does one become a, quote, swimmer, unquote? What do you think? Nothing is as simple or straightforward as it seems. And it's only when the magnitude of your accomplishments makes you question everyday problems and discomforts, and perhaps discover a newfound empathy for others. Then you know you're on the right track. In the case of today's guest, her pure joy and wonder in the water is contagious. And despite having swum all of the Maui channels, she opens with, I'm not a swimmer. May we all be infected by Terry Dietz's burning curiosity. I hope you enjoy her story. Hi, Terry. How are you today? <laughs> I'm great. Thank you so much, Sharon. Terry, very nice to have you here today. Tell me, what's your story? Oh, my goodness, Sharon. Thank you so much for having me today. It's quite an honor. Oh, my gosh, my story. <laughs> Wow, it's been, I, I kind of laugh because I'm going to start it this way. I'm not a swimmer. I swim like a rock. <laughs> I really do. I, I Backwards even. And I'll never forget working with my coach in the pool one day. She looked at me and she's like, oh my God, you swim backwards beautifully. Meanwhile, mind you, I'm swimming freestyle, okay? <laughs> so I, I have not been swimming all my life, but at one point, training with my coach after this swim race on the North Shore. And the North Shore Swim Series is fabulous because it's these short races that build from a mile to a little bit more, up to three miles, right? And I was like, sure, I can do this. And I got so frustrated. That's the athlete in me. And I looked at Michelle one day, I'm like, am I ever going to get better at this? And she looks at me and says, you know what? I have no idea. But... <laughs> I'll tell you what, let's find out. And that's all it took. That was like, for me, I think with all of us in swimming, there's that gateway drug that happens at one race or that one moment. For me, that was the moment. That was my gateway into, well, what can I do? What is possible? Stay curious. So I guess I've been swimming about since about 2017. And I got into it because I had back surgery. I finally from all my years of competing in aerobic gymnastics and everything else, it, <laughs> I now a proud owner of a fused back. And I'm kind of bionic in a way. But my surgeon asked me, he goes, you know, what do you plan to do after this? Because if you're not careful, you go back to doing what you're doing, you're going to come back and see me. And I'm like, well, that's not an option. <laughs> and he just said, I'd love, love to see you swimming. 
The problem with that was he never said how much. (laughs) So it started incrementally. I couldn't swim after my surgery. I literally had to swim like a buoy in the water, bobbing parallel in the water or perpendicular. And it went from there to transitioning to dog paddle. And then, you know, my husband was very supportive of this. He's like, you start swimming. I think it'll be great for you. Do the North Shore swim series and all that. And it just slowly led from one thing to another where I just was like, wow, if I can swim this, what else can I swim? And when I first did my first 10K, that was to me like a gold standard before I could do a bigger swim channel. I had no clue that all this swimming was out there. So I'm like a kid in a candy store. I still am just figuring all this out. So one thing led to another. I hit my 10K. I almost died. I really thought I was going to die. Uh, <laughs> it's like, oh my God. But after that, I had a swim friend, Bill Godding, actually says, you know, Ao Ao Channel, which goes between Lanai, Maui, and Maui itself, Maui Island here in Hawaii. He goes, it's only a couple more miles. And that's all it took. So that was the other part to the gateway. <laughs> Take me back to how you got to your first 10K from doggy paddle, because that's a big transition. (laughs) Well, I was using, so I went from doggy paddling upright Upright. to the like, okay, because they did not want me moving my back around at all to finally they gave me a kickboard, but the kickboard had, it wasn't even a kickboard. I used a kind of like a boogie board. So it would go under my hips. They didn't want me moving my hips yet. So they got me in the water as quickly as they could. And my husband actually had to throw me in because I was so afraid of um, like, oh my God, I'm going to hurt myself again. I I had to get through that piece, but I was also afraid I was going to give myself an infection. And he's like, they're not going to let you in the water if your back wasn't completely sealed up, healed up, all that good stuff. Yeah. So we went from doggy paddle upright to (laughs) boogie board underneath me (laughs) to doggy paddle without you know, regular doggy paddle to swimming. If you're familiar with Oahu and Kaimana Beach, there's this great beach we swim off of and it has a windsock at where the channel starts, right? And that was a big deal for me, making it that far and back in. I mean, that process of over many weeks, um, it was a full year before I could really swim, put any power into it. And even nowadays, flip turns in the pool, they're disastrous and I have to be careful. <laughs> yeah. Were you a swimmer before? No. Mm-mm. Not at all. Okay. Did you have any fear of the water or anything? I loved it. I loved it. Growing up, we always had a family vacation once a year to Sunset Beach, North Carolina. And I loved it. And I was always so depressed for about a month. I couldn't figure it out. Now I look back and I understand. I'm so drawn to the water. So you've always loved the water, but uh, had just never been a swimmer. And there's somehow you got from North Carolina to Hawaii, and maybe that isn't part of your swim story. So <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a separate part of my yeah. story. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> So you're not on a boogie board anymore. You're able to do some kind of stroke thing and you decide to sign up for this one mile. So you start training in some way, shape, manner. Yeah. And then that's how it started. And so between my husband, the surgeon and a girlfriend of mine that said, hey, you should do the North Shore Swim Series. That's where it all started. And before I did that 10K, the last swim in the past of the North Shore Swim Series, there was two races you could do. One that was, uh, that's two or three miles. And then there was one you could do a 10K. And I'm watching all these people or a handful of people going out and they're doing the 10K because they start before us. And I'm like, what are they doing? Again, I have no clue. I have absolutely no clue (laughs) what's going on. And they're like, oh, that's the crew that's doing the 10K. And I went, what's that? And they're like, hey, I have no idea. They're like, that's about six miles. I went, oh, I want to do that. You know, (laughs) they're like, oh, I first have to be able to swim that. So there was all those little things that I'm watching people do. And I'm like, wow, you can do all this. You can swim that far. You can go between islands, you know, in channels. I'm like, wow, this is cool. So it opened up my box of curiosity and 
what's possible? And I'm like, well, if I could swim a mile, why can't I swim six? <laughs> and I think, it, and also too, for me and for many of us, the North Shore in the summertime, the water is spectacular. It's clear. It's just, it's breathtaking. How can you not love that? Yeah. So it just invites you in for a swim. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And some more. Come back. (laughs) So tell me, you said you almost died after your first 10K. Tell us a little bit more about what almost killed you about that. (laughs) Okay. So maybe that's a little dramatic, but I was just like, I'm like, oh my God, my arms are going to fall off. You just don't know what you're in for, which I think is a good thing um, on many levels, not to know everything. Just the sheer amount of the volume, which I had no clue what that volume building was all about. What I used to do was 90 seconds long. It was an all out sprint and you're done in 90 seconds. So that's a whole different engine that I built. And that's something over the last, what, six, seven years, I've had to undo and rebuild my engine. So I've had to keep that in mind. It's not an easy thing to do, but yeah, I went from going 90 seconds to suddenly I have three, four hours in the water. It's probably longer. It is interesting that kind of make that shift. And it's interesting to me that your draw to the water and your curiosity to want to see what these other people are doing just encouraged you to kind of explore what it would take to shift. But it sounds like you've got one gear. (laughs) It's like, go, 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 go. I had working with a another cold water coach recently, and he's just like, your climb into cold water swimming is like this. I mean, it's the biggest hill climb, right? And I'm thinking, well, my 10K, learning how to swim a 10K was like was just as big. And I'm laughing and he goes, you're going to swim yourself to death before you do anything else. And I'm like, yeah, probably. <laughs> So we'll come back to what you're looking to train for that needs cold water. But take us from that. You're after your 10K, it almost killed you, but you want more. How did we, what did you get to the, what was next? I will have to mention that they do the out channel relay in July. Unfortunately, with COVID and everything, they haven't been able to host that in a couple of years. So, but I had the opportunity to swim this channel relay, which I have no clue what I'm doing. Um, somehow I was like, hey, that looks like fun. I want to do it. And I got on a crew from Australia. I was on the fourth crew, which was great. So there was really not a whole lot of pressure, but I didn't know what I was getting myself into. But at least I had a 30 minute swim. So I trained for that. And then once everybody, all six of us swam 30 minutes, we were in and out every 10. But they sent me to the start line. I was scared to death of like, oh my God. And they're like, be careful. Make sure you stay within the little channel and, you know, all these warnings. And I, again, I don't have a clue of what's going on. So I'm, I think I was up all night worried about I was going to get lost or whatever. But I was the first one onto the beach and I watched all these other swimmers that were going to start for their crew swimming onto the beach. This is the English channel, right? No, this was for the Ow Ow Relay. And in oh, Maui, okay. yeah, no, thank you. And I'm just <laughs> sure to clarify. Um, trust me, I was not ready for the English channel. <laughs> <laughs> but, I'm just watching all these other start swimmers. And the thought was, oh my gosh, they're all mer people coming out of the water. They were just incredible. And I was standing there going, oh, I'm in the wrong place. (laughs) But it was the most incredible experience to be in the water to start with them. And the whole field, like you can feel it elevating out of the water and whoosh, they just took off. And I'm just left there going, what? what? Oh, swim. (laughs) But after that, and then I realized, hey, there's somebody up by themselves. And they're like, yes, they're swimming solo. So it was all these little pieces that opened my eyes and it all kind of converged. Once I did my 10K, I went, oh, I'm going to go back and swim out out now solo. And I did that with a small swim pod of mine, very close swim buddies uh, that a lot of us, we get ourselves into our, our own journeys and trouble and it's so much fun, but we did it. And I'm like, if I can do that, what else can I do? And It's like now go swim the other channels that there that we have in Maui. And that's what I did. 
Let's get to those other two. Tell me, take me to some hard parts. It can't have been just easy to cross the Maui Channel. How do you no, pronounce it? So we have Au, Au Channel, A-U-A-U, and then you have the Pailolo Channel. And that goes from, and again, it depends to what direction you're going to go in, but you're going from Maui to Molokai. And then you have Kalohi Channel, and Kalohi goes from Molokai to Lanai. And that became my most famous, that is my favorite and very, very, very special channel. And that's the channel that opened the door for me to swim Kaibi Channel. What's the distance of the Maui Channel? They'll average anywhere from about nine to 12 miles. And I'm going to say that because you've got current. So you never know, yeah, how that's going to iron out for you. And so, yes, there's been times that, you know, you've been in there. I've been in many of those channels many times. And (laughs) somehow it's like eight hours later. You're like, what happened? And the current is just pulling you somewhere. (laughs) And that's that makes it hard. And that's a hard thing with it. So you get that. You can get the wind swells in there. But the biggest thing in those channels is the current. (laughs) And you've got your critters in there, the sharks that add a little bit of excitement. You have man of war that love to sting you up and, you know. All these things. Have you ever had any trouble with like feeding or anything while on these big channels? I hate to eat in the water. That's one thing I'm still working on. And I actually get very sick. Um, I get very seasick and working on triaging, if it's the amount of calories coming in, hydration, all that stuff. I've spent good portions of swims very sick. So I can tell you all about that, but we don't need to go there. Well, it's interesting, though, that that hasn't discouraged you at all. You're just, you're still. I think think this last swim that I did, we just completed Molokini to Lanai uh, swim. It was the first time it was attempted. It was quite an honor. It's beautiful water. It was an amazing swim. But it went from being 20, between 20 to 24 miles because of the current. It turned into, you know, a 30 mile swim. It was one of those. And yeah, by the end, uh, one of the guys with us, I just said, are we almost done? I'm thinking to myself, I'm so tired of throwing up. (laughs) I just, what have you done? But you can't beat when you have a whale with a baby swimming with you, dolphins. And this was a very special swim because nobody got stung. There was no sharks. It was incredible that way. We just, but what she gave us was, you're going to deal with the current. So what are you going to do? Just keep swimming till you can't. How common do you think shoulder injury is in masters and college swimmers? It's a jaw-dropping statistic that you'll learn in the new Minimizing Risk of Shoulder Injury in Freestyle Swimmers course from Swim Mastery. This 60-minute online course is packed with useful information about why shoulder injury is so common in swimming, as well as practical tips to put into practice right away. Go to swimmastery.online and navigate to the shop in the resources menu, or email me, shannon at intrepidwater.com, and I'll send you a direct link so that you can start swimming pain-free today. I can see the draw and it, you guys, I am thinking back to some of my conversations with like Stefan Renke, you guys do some of these channels, like it's groups, right? So it's, you're not out there by yourself necessarily with the boat. When I did my Kaibi swim from Molokai to Oahu, when I did, completed that swim, I was solo. What was that like compared to these other swims with your friend? It was a magical swim. It was very special to me. I had an amazing crew. I had everything from, yeah, I I got stung up some. I had a beautiful night. I had fairly, really good conditions, some spicy current, sharks. I had three sharks with me that hung out for about a couple hours. (laughs) And I had a crazy finish where it wasn't on Sandy's Beach. It was actually on Irma's. So I somehow, by the grace of God, we skimmed in over the rocks and everything without getting all beat up. And here it is 7.30 at night and pitch black. So <laughs> so I was definitely looked out after for that one. But um, it just, even, it was a lot to unpack because that was the biggest channel, the longest channel that I've ever swum before in my life. And it was, wow, number one, I did it. 
it wasn't pretty, but I did it. And I could say that, wow, I, I did it. And I was very, very proud of myself. And it was so special all the way around from start to finish. And it still brings a lot of tears and just a lot of emotion that you can take on something that size. But when you learn to chip it down into pieces, those 30 minute pieces, it's possible, it's doable if it's something you really want to do. And you find your edges, you know, you find those edges that you're looking for and you go to where you almost fall off the cliff, but you don't. And you find that there's a little bit more edge to go on to. That's the place from me, for me and my brain. It's like, wow, this is spectacular. You can read about it. You listen to other athletes and athletes stories. But when you can be in the moment and experience it, Oh, that's the magic. And I'm very grateful that I'm having those opportunities. That's beautiful. So beautiful. I want to hear a little bit more about sharks. Tell me more about how you live with the company of sharks, let's say. Well, you know, they definitely require all the respect in the world. We are, once you get in the water, you're in their territory. That's the home. And they're curious, you know, they're more curious and they don't necessarily want to eat you. But, you know, if you look like an easy target, then, but you have to have the respect, you have to have the trust of your team and crew for them to keep an eye out on what's going on. And interesting with my Kaivi swim, I didn't know they were back there with me, but I had two that were trailing me. And I had no clue because by this point I'd been really sick. I'm not eating and I'm, but I'm just like, we're finishing this. Right. And but I couldn't figure out why they kept sending spotters in the water. And I'm like, Whoa, I must really look like a drunken sailor out here. They're afraid something I'm going to like sink myself. And it wasn't until they were like right on top of me, almost the spotters. And my swim coach was actually in with me. And I hear this. She kind of swore, which was very evident. And she, I swear to goodness gracious, she was walking on water and on the boat, like in a flash. And at that point I went, oh, something's not right. (laughs) And that's when the third shark swam in. And apparently he was swimming a little bit more aggressively. And next thing I hear very calmly from the boat was, Terry, get on the back of the boat and be ready to grab the rescue sled. And at that point, I, you know, the hair kind of stands up on the back of your neck a little bit. You're like, oh my God, okay. So I'm back there and Mike Spalding, he looks at me and he calmly says, Terry, put your face in the water, make eye contact with those sharks. And I went, look, I quickly put my head down and look, look up. And I'm like, I see nothing. (laughs) And then I'm starting to get mad. I'm like, I swim through the night. I'm more than halfway through this channel. I'm not coming back. And that was the thought process at that point. And (laughs) they gave me the green light to come off the back of the boat because I'm sitting there treading water, right? Hands up, ready to grab. And they give me the green light to swim around and continue to swim. So I start swimming and I look down and in Kaivi Channel, the water is so blue And when the sunlight's coming down, it's just like the chandelier of light is gorgeous, right? Well, I'm looking at this and I put my eyes almost straight down. And what do I see? Shark number three. (laughs) And I'm like, (sighs) so I pop my head up and I'm like, critter, put my head back down. And I take my fist and I make a fist and I'm yelling at the shark. And I literally tell him, if you're not going to play nice, go away because I'm not doing this again. And I've made it through the night and I'm finishing this. I'm yelling at him in the water. They send the spotter in. Actually, Mike Spalding, he gets in with me and he calmly starts swimming and the shark's gone. And that was the end of the sharks. So. (laughs) Wow. You let him know. You told him I'm swimming this. Get out of my way. (laughs) Pretty much. And for that day, Kaibi, she said, you can finish. She gave me the okay to finish. And I look at Kaibi channel. She is big. She's a beast. She's majestic, but she's humbling and 150% respect for her. 
in every channel for that matter. Absolutely. I am trying to figure out, I recently had a swim that involves some of the surrender to whatever might be there and a lot of what you're talking about. And I'm trying to figure out how to talk to our listeners about that process, that surrender and that respect and feeling looked after. Those are your words. And I want to, I mean, can you talk to me more about how you've come to that place where you can feel that? Yeah, I think part of the process and this journey is learning how to find that. How do you cultivate it? It doesn't just happen. I think you get lucky every once in a while, but it doesn't just happen. You have to cultivate it. It's the people you surround yourself with, the mentors that you have. And when you go out and you start your open water swimming with people you trust, and that helps to build your confidence. You learn to pay attention to what the water is doing. I do a lot of mental work with learning how to kind of quickly get into, and this doesn't happen overnight, but it helps you kind of get into this flow space. And, but that's taken lots and lots of practice and, and finding mantras that connect your brain and your heart and your soul that you just resonates for you. It's not just, oh, that sounds great. I'm going to use it. It has to resonate for you. And so when the going gets tough, because it will, those wheels are going to come off, you know? You can go to that, but you have to cultivate it and you have to stay curious. And again, like I just mentioned, it's your crew, it's your team that you surround yourself with. And working with Mike Spaulding, he's just like, you know, everything has to line up for a channel to be successful from the weather to your crew, to the swimmer being ready to go, mind, body and spirit. And I hold that very close. And I think patience is a big part of all this process as well. And I learned from Marcia Cleveland, I hold this dear to me. She bestowed upon me, patience must prevail. I had to go back to Kaivi a second time. I didn't make it across the first time. The first time I was pulled out about five, six miles in, it was a great night, but it wasn't meant to be. And I didn't walk out of there feeling, oh, I'm such a horrible person. I walked out of there going, wow, what just happened? (laughs) I mean, I kept having to ask my husband, what happened? He goes, Tara, you didn't make it. I'm like, I know, but it was still such a big thing that I couldn't fathom. I couldn't get my brain wrapped around it. And that really, I think at that point, that's when the journey for me into ultra swimming and long distance swimming really began. It was like, I got to figure this out. My brain couldn't make order of the enormous, how big this was. And I had to learn that piece. So I took that next year to do it. And it allowed me to be able to handle the bigger. And it wasn't, yeah, you need the volume and all that. But mentally, it put me in a much better space to go back to those, hey, 30 minutes, 30 minutes or 45, however you do your feedings. And it's possible. Stay curious. Well, if I can do this, what if we do this, this and this? It's beautiful. Yeah. It's amazing. And I just love the words you're putting on so many feelings and sensations and things I want to be able to relay. This is such a gorgeous conversation. Well, thank you. So talk to me a little, I want to hear a little bit more just because I love the patience must prevail. And I had this golden opportunity last summer. Marsha Cleveland just happened to come here to Oregon and I didn't get to talk to her nearly enough. I didn't get to talk to her nearly enough, but anyway, I love that her words are coming back. But the first time that you did the KV channel, you didn't, you said you didn't make it. Tell me a little bit about like why you thought you were ready and like, you know, like some of, yeah, just to take me back there a little bit. The athlete, basically why I thought I was right. The athlete in me said, let's go. <laughs> let's go. Yeah. Let's just do it. Right. And the other part, no, it just, everything wasn't lined up yet. It just wasn't lined up. And, and for me, I got very badly stung up that night, like, and that kind of ended my swim when you get to a point where your arms aren't able to move anymore. That's a little scary. And it was just like, let me try to keep going. And I just, I physically couldn't. And then at that point, yeah, our waters here are warm, but at nighttime when you get the wind blowing, you get a little hypothermia going on too, you know? So you got to learn all those pieces and parts as well. So it was a interesting night to say the least, but And it was like, okay, 
let's figure this out because there is a bigger part of me that felt this is doable. It's not easy, but it's doable. And so over that next year, I had the, and prior to this too, one of the other things I love doing is I love being a feeder for swimmers when they cross Kaibi. And Stefan Renke connected me to Marsha Cleveland and I was one of her feeders for her swim. I learned so much and I learned how to become a better feeder from her, how to become a better swimmer, how to harness my brain better. And I'll never forget looking at her. And I I actually snapped this picture when she was taking a feed or someone else did, but I have it. She's taking a feed. And even through her smoky goggles, I could see the grit in her eyes, in her heart and her soul. And it was amazing to be part of that journey. And I learned so much from her. And that also was part of my learning process for my next swim coming up. Yeah, let's just take a minute to, because I, I'm i just in awe of any person who's ever crewed for me. Like, it's such a gift to have these people be on my, you know, be part of my team or to be the team because it isn't even my team. It's our team. We're doing this. You know, it's so much doing it together. Um, So tell me a little bit of that, what you've learned and like what recommendations you'd have for swimmers to know about their feeders so that they're, I feel like feeding even it's like this interesting label for the job that they're doing because it feels so much bigger than that. But Something more glamorous, but I mean, that's what you're doing. But I look at it as that crew, that's my life support. Without them, I'm a dead fish in the water. They are everything from the minute you start your swim to when you end it. They are your life support. So you need to look at it and go, could I be stuck on a desert island with this person and know that we're all going to be able to contribute our parts? That's how I look at it. And the other thing, too, is I also don't force it. And when you go, and you ask people, can you blah, blah, blah. It'll work out the way it's supposed to work out. And that's the hardest thing to let go of is just trusting that your crew is going to line up the way it's supposed to. And sometimes it's a little bit off. Yeah. But for the most part, and then eventually you start develop, you start finding that crew that becomes your center that goes with you or does a lot more of this with you on a regular basis. And you have interchangeable parts, but you have to trust the process and give it space to unfold. And be very clear in your thoughts, what you're looking for, what your needs are. And I know it's hard as the person in the water and everybody's doing all this for you because it takes a tribe of a team of people to get one person across or a, a group of people across the water, right? It's easy not to say, hey, I need this, this, and this and be an advocate for yourself in the water. And sometimes mentally, it's just hard because of where you are. So hopefully your crew's asking the right questions, right? or asking questions, and maybe a lot of them sometimes, because you do have to be an advocate every once in a while for what you need to be. And you can do it very nicely, and it's fine. But sometimes you're the only person that knows in the moment what it is you need, and ask for it. It's okay. Yeah, that was a big learning for me (laughs) as a swimmer, to advocate for myself. Because you're right, you're in that moment, you're definitely the only one that knows your body, what's going on, you know, (laughs) what's... And you have to trust that you can, that that's what your crew's there for. You know, they're there for you. So you need to advocate for that, what you need and the, and to do that nicely, obviously. It's always nice. <laughs> it is. Absolutely. It is, for sure. Yeah. But it's a never ending process. And I watch swimmers that come here and they make their attempts at Kaivi and other. And I, now that my eyes keep getting more open and open to all the different possibilities that are out there, it's just, you just keep learning. And I see, you know, swimmer swim past me because I'm still that rock in the water, but it's okay. You learn too that it's your channel. It's how you're going to swim it. And that's how you're going to do it. It's, it's in your style. And that I think is pretty cool is that you're going to swim it your style and it's your mark. It's the mark that you leave. It's your own personal win success story. And even if you don't finish, I think if you can walk away with the nuggets of information to go back and build from, then it's a success. Yeah, that's a good way to, I like that a lot. But I mean, I guess I am always talking with my swimmers and, you know, 
friends, of course, who people are doing these. It's like, it's an adventure. You know, it's not like it's a race. We're not trying to win. <laughs> We're just going on an adventure and to look at what can I get from this experience that, like you said, will inform the rest of any other than experience that you're going to have. It's that's a way more fulfilling, I guess, way to think of it than like I've got to win or I'm going to beat someone. I don't know. I think too, I mean, for me, as you get a little bit older, yeah, I, I still like to be able to drop down, a, you know, and I'll pump out a hundred pushups and, and challenge somebody. I mean, that's, I think there's a part of my brain that's always going to be like that. But the bigger part is when it comes to this, it's just like, wow. Cause it's always about, I have a, always have a purpose of the why, why do you do this? And each to each one of us, you have to you have to discover what that is because then, as you mentioned, it gives the swim, not even just that swim, but the training. It gives it, that's where all the meaning is. That's where, that's where you find the energy to get out of bed in the morning and to, you know, do that, whatever you have to do for your swim, your training, you do it. Know your why. Yeah. Oh man, what a trip. So the, so you've done all the channels or, or um, oh, no, no, no. Okay. No, no, no. Oh, I got many to do. <laughs> My poor husband. In the, on the, I, and we're talking the Hawaiian Island channels. I guess really one more that I'd be interested in doing. And then, you know, some of the other ones are very, very big and very long. And there's very little windows of opportunity to swim those um, just because of the weather. And yeah, the weather basically that allows that to happen. So yeah, we'll see where the water takes me next for sure. Yeah. Do you have anything on, on your mind that you would share? I will share because this has been a process. I'm looking forward to doing my first SCAR event here in April. Yay. That's exciting. <laughs> so, yeah. That's where the cold water training has been coming yeah. in. Yeah. So we'll see. I'll take it one day at a time. And I'm just excited to be, it'll be wonderful to be around people from all over the place. And we're all kind of experiencing the same experience, but we all have, you know, our own swims that we're doing too. And so it'll be a little bit different atmosphere than getting in at whatever time at night and swimming alone by yourself through the channel in the dark in the cold. So it has a little different feel, but again, not easy. And I'm leaving some things to be just experience them as they come um, and do what I can in the meantime, but the rest, just let it unfold as it's supposed to unfold and learn. So it'll be fun. It'll be fun. Yeah. I'm excited for you. I can't wait to hear how it goes. Yeah, I know. I know. Thank you. Cause I know you've done it a couple of times too just one but yeah one and I started it once but (laughs) I can't wait to hear how it goes is Stefan traveling back out with you we'll see we'll see so I hope so because uh partner in crime (laughs) it'll be good thank you for sharing your story today Terry oh Shannon thank you so much for having me on your podcast and your show it's been a delight to meet you and I look forward to having another conversation with you yeah absolutely let's do it I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you were inspired by even just a moment of this story, please share it with a friend. You never know what might push someone out of their comfort zone so that they can find out what they're capable of. And please leave a review with your podcast provider. It truly helps others discover the raw and honest stories of these amazing endurance swimmers. Thanks for listening.